And my subject for this talk is the poetry of T.S. Eliot. Almost the first thing that anyone learns about Eliot is that he was a modernist. However, unlike other writers who also come under the modernist umbrella, Eliot didn't pass through any earlier phases to become modernist, as did, say, W.B. Yeats, who began by writing romantic poetry, or Virginia Woolf, who started out as a kind of realist. Eliot was born modernist, which means that even his earliest poetry comes with certain inbuilt difficulties. Now, I don't really have time to define or to delineate modernism, but I will say that difficulty is one of its traits, by which I mean the kind of work that makes demands on its readers, that doesn't offer up its meanings too readily, and that doesn't seem to come logically out of what's gone before. Once we accept Eliot's difficulty, though, that puts us in a better position to understand his work. It means that we can adjust our expectations accordingly and try to figure out how to read it. So what I want to do over the next 25 or so minutes is three things. First, I want to offer one or two pointers in terms of how to read Eliot and how he might differ from other earlier poetry that you've read, particularly romantic poetry. Second, I want to briefly to run through the five poems on the syllabus and say um, a few things about each of them. And then finally, I'll take a much closer look at the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, and read a couple of stanzas. So let's start with how to read Eliot. And the first thing to be said is that no matter how odd or eccentric his poetry may seem, kinds of metaphors or symbols that he uses, say, or the imagery that he evokes, it's never nonsense. Everything is there for a purpose, and it's our duty as readers to try and figure out what that purpose is. One thing that becomes clear the more you read Eliot is his supreme command of poetic form. Even as he combines what might appear to be the uncombinable, his poems don't fall apart. More than this, they even start to make a strange kind of sense. I want to stress that, sorry, I also want to stress that once you know how to read Eliot, his poetry can be enormously pleasurable. There's real enjoyment to be had from the way that he puts things together, from the leaps that he makes between objects and or ideas, and just from the sheer linguistic brio or exuberance that his poems exemplify. So don't think of Eliot as primarily an intellectual or cerebral poet who's invested in his own highfalutin thoughts. He can also be very playful and inventive if you're tuned in to the poem's frequencies. Eliot likes to use irony and paradox in his writing, but perhaps the chief paradox is that despite all his formal innovations, all his linguistic daring, he was actually quite conservative. In fact, he believed that with only one or two exceptions, English poetry, poetry written in English, ended in 1800. After 1800, it's romanticism that dominates poetry in France and Germany as much as in England and America. And at least in the latter two countries, it continues to dominate throughout the 19th century. So this is what Eliot is seeking to break with when he starts out as a writer. One romanticist legacy, which is still evident today, is that there's a kind of knee-jerk tendency to read literary works as if they were autobiographical in some way or ways. The author can't be too far from the surface of the text, we tell ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Otherwise, why would he or she bother to write it in the first place? We have the romantics to blame for this tendency because they were so committed to their own thoughts and feelings. We're accustomed to reading any kind of intimacy in poems as emanating directly from the poet's heart or soul. Now, when it comes to Eliot, this poses something of a problem. Rather than bearing his soul for the reader, Eliot is more concerned with hiding, with using language and form to say things that are not traceable back to his own direct experiences. Or to put this another way, Eliot isn't the speaker in his poems, confessing his thoughts and feelings through the lines on the page. He's more like the arranger or orchestrator of those lines with his motifs and rhythms and illusions, creating patterns using a variety of different techniques. So if you go looking for the real Thomas Stearns Eliot in Prufrock or Preludes or The Hollow Men, you're not gonna find him. Although you might, might find his fingerprints in the various themes or fixations that drive these poems. 
the word that's often used to describe this technique of the poets hiding in plain sight is impersonality. In 1919, Eliot published Tradition and the Individual Talent, an essay, one of the key critical documents in the history of modernism. Here's how it appeared in The Egoist, a modernist magazine. In the first part of the essay, Eliot declares his conservatism in the sense of wanting to preserve the literary tradition whilst still allowing for newness, for literary novelty. What he does want to get rid of though, or at least diminish or devalue, is the personality of the poet, the very thing that the Romantics made central to their art. Rather than glorify this aspect of the poetic self, Eliot insists that the poet must surrender personality in favor of something more valuable. The progress of an artist, he says, is a continual self-sacrifice, a continual extinction of personality. What is that more valuable thing that supersedes personality? Eliot soon lets us know. For my meaning is that the poet has not a personality to express, but a particular medium, which is only a medium and not a personality, in which impressions and experiences combine in peculiar and unexpected ways. Impressions and experiences which are important for the man take no place in the poetry, and those which become important in the poetry may play quite a negligible part in the man, the personality. And just so there's no misunderstanding. Poetry is not a turning loose of emotion, but an escape from emotion. It's not the expression of personality, but an escape from personality. But of course, only those who have personality and emotions know what it means to want to escape from these things. Poetry shouldn't wallow in emotion. It should view it with detachment, abstractedly. That last sentence uh, in this quotation is often omitted when this essay is quoted from, by people who want to present Eliot as cold, heartless, and self-obsessed. This may or may not be an accurate description of Eliot the man, but it certainly doesn't apply to Eliot's poetry, which is often full of emotion, even if it's only being conveyed implicitly, as is the case with Prufrock. So bearing all this in mind, let's turn now to the five poems that are, are our objects of study. Note that I've put publication dates here rather than composition dates. There's not such a discrepancy with the two later poems, but Prufrock, Preludes and Rhapsody, although they have different dates, were all written in 1910 or 11 when Eliot was studying at the Sorbonne in Paris. As the first works of a fledgling poet, they still strike us as rich and strange even 110 years later. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, I'll be dealing with in more detail in a moment, but for now we might think of the poem as a feminine piece of writing. Its original title was Prufrock Among the Women, and women do feature in it, uh, if somewhat obliquely or incidentally. Its rhythms, its tones, and its dreamlike textures could, however, be seen as feminine quality that becomes more evident when, set, when the poem is set alongside the wasteland or the Hollow Men, which are monuments to masculine modernism with their much harder, drier, and more severe images and illusions. For a reader in the 1910s, preludes must have come as something of a shock. Where poetry in the Romantic and Victorian ages sought to elevate or to ennoble, here we have a poet writing, as it were, from the gutter. Burnt out ends, grimy scraps, withered leaves, and broken blinds. He's conveying to us what city life is really like, not so much a space of fast-paced industrial wonder as a locus of destitution. Eliot is attracted then to subjects that you wouldn't necessarily call poetic, low subjects such as urban seediness and squalor, the underside of metropolitan life to which many modernist writers were drawn. Part three is written in the second person, unusual in a poem, and it appears to be addressing a woman. You curled the papers from your hair, a technique for styling pin curls. Is she a prostitute or a factory worker? In any case, she's been ground down by the city with its thousand sordid images, and that's left physical traces on her soiled hands. I made a claim earlier for playfulness as an Eliotian quality, at least in these early poems. Rhapsody on a Windy Night bears this out. In the second stanza, 
the narration of the poem is suddenly handed over to a street lamp, no less, an inanimate object that splutters and mutters and tells us what's going on. And the first thing it draws to our, our attention is a woman by an open doorway. This woman we can impute is a sex worker who hesitates in the light of the door, which opens on her like a grin, an extraordinarily vivid image that's also slightly unsettling. What does that grin know? What's it withholding? Rhapsody is a poem about memory, which is tied to the detritus of the city, and it's especially odoriferous, at least half a dozen times throughout the poem, Eliot reminds us of the smells of the city, acting as agents in recollecting some key details of city life. With The Hollow Man, we jump ahead a decade to 1925 and to Eliot's last high modernist work. As should seem clear, this is a very different T.S. Eliot in terms of his stylistic concerns. On the one hand, the poem's dreamlike ambience aligns it with both true frock and the night reverie that is Rhapsody. On the other, though, it has more of a nightmarish quality with the hollow man of the title stranded in purgatory. The hollow man is also a heavily intertextual poem. Eliot's heaviest, in fact, alongside the wasteland. Yet Eliot has always borrowed from other writers' work, either by quoting directly or by, or by reworking more subtly. Prufrock, for example, opens with an epigraph from the Italian poet Dante and refers to Shakespeare's Hamlet and to French symbolist poetry. By the same token, The Hollow Man is much more relentless and much more complex in its textual borrowings. The title comes from another Shakespeare play, Julius Caesar. The epigraph, Mr. Kurtz, he dead, is from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, a journey to the heart of Africa that's also a journey to corruption, death, and horror, not unlike the Hollow Man. And there are allusions throughout to Dante's divine comedy, particularly the purgatorial parts of the poem. The fourth intertext is historical rather than literary. The gunpowder plot concocted by Guy Fawkes and a few associates in 1605, a failed attempt to blow up London's Houses of Parliament. The playfulness that we find in Prufrock, Preludes and Rhapsody is now gone. When Eliot does quote from a child's nursery rhyme, here we go around the prickly pear, it's sinister and ominous rather than playful, a lead in to the end of the world image with which the poem closes. Finally, Journey of the Magi. It appeared only two years after The Hollow Man, but it too is a radically different kind of poem. It tells the story of the three wise men and their journey to Bethlehem where Christ was born. Rather than celebrating this epochal event, Though the speaker concentrates instead on its after effects, how the culture and belief system that preceded Christ, largely based on superstition, was overturned, leaving a whole people stranded and confused. The Magus speaker doesn't decry this change, nor does he question Christ's divinity. Rather, he identifies with those lost and confused people and understands that some cultural changes are just too drastic to be fully absorbed or embraced. Unlike the four other poems, this is clearly a narrative poem telling the story of a journey, even as the non-narrative part of the poem, the displacement of one spiritual or devotional system with another is its real subject. And that brings us to the third and final part of this talk, and the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. I won't be examining the poem in its entirety. We certainly don't have time for that, but I will focus rather on the opening and closing stanzas and use these to talk about the work's thematic concerns. The poem comes from Eliot's first book of poetry, Prufrock and Other Observations, published in 1917, um, as you can see, here on the slide. Although, as I said, many of the poems in it were written much earlier. Rhapsody and Preludes are also from this first Eliot collection. The very title of the book suggests objectivity, the point of view of a detached observer rather than a participant. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock itself goes beyond just detachment, beyond mere observation, because the speaker has 
what's been called a curiously empty poetic voice, a voice that's defined by negation and by what should have been. If proof rock can even be said to have a self, it's an unstable and intermittent one that escapes every attempt at being pinned down. Prufrock himself then is in some ways absent from the poem. The name, however, is rich with illusion. You risk looking pompous or elitist when you give yourself an initial instead of a first name. J. Alfred Prufrock could be the name of, of a banker, were it not for that overloaded surname. Prufrock summons up words like prudence and prudery, whilst the frock adds a touch of effeminacy. Remember, I suggested a moment ago that this could be read as a feminine poem. A cross-dressing banker perhaps might encompass all of the implications latent in the name. With the poem itself, we get Eliot's central theme, regret at situations unexplored by a character whose passions are inhibit inhibited because he's too timid or too reticent, because he's dared too little. It's the fear of vulgarity that inhibits him. A fear common amongst Americans, New Worlders often uh, coming up against ex more experienced old Europe or Great Britain, aware that they themselves come from a tradition that is barely 200 years old. Okay, stanza one, let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through ha certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. The stanza, in a sense, wrong foots us. It begins and ends with what seems to be purpose and resoluteness. Let us go then, you and I. What could be more assertive than that? Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. Unfortunately, that seems to be about it as far as Prufrock's decisiveness goes. The rest of the poem shows how lacking he is in any decision-making qualities. And in fact, his true character is hinted at in line three, like a patient etherized upon a table, one of the most striking figurations in all modern poetry, and the comparison it's drawing with the evening descending on the city. What the etherized patient suggests, in fact, is the desire for sleep, for repose, or perhaps for oblivion. Prufrock is an incurable romantic whose life has been given over to daydreams and reveries. If the realities of existence have not yet hit him, that's because he's successfully avoided them, but it's also left him powerless and impotent. He knows he should choose a more purposeful life, but he's unable to choose, like Prince Hamlet, and this brings on despair. So the poem is the desolation of a romantic aesthete and hedonist who is pathologically unable to make an existential decision. It's left him, as a result, full of misgivings about how useful and worthwhile his past life has been. The following lines are emblematic of Eliot's interests at this stage of his career. Through certain half deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. So even though Prufrock's head is in the clouds, Eliot makes sure that the poem reveals the earthier side of things that his speaker might prefer to avoid. And in case you're wondering, especially low-class restaurants in this era had sawdust all over their floors to make it easier to sweep up oyster shells and other detritus that patrons had discarded. Not a particularly inviting or agreeable image, but certainly continuous with Eliot's concerns, as we saw in Preludes with the sordid underside of things. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead to the finale, pausing just to draw your attention to the refrain in the women in the room, the women come and go talking of Michelangelo. There's a dreamlike quality to much of this poem, as I've suggested, 
as if it were taking place in a theater of sleep. The etherized patient in the opening lines, the cat and the fog falling asleep in the next section, and the afternoon that sleeps so peacefully a bit further on. But this image here is the quintessence of that mood. Why are the women talking of Michelangelo? It's not so much that they're talking of the great Renaissance artists, it's that they're not talking about proof rock. Michelangelo is renowned for his paintings and sculptures of heroic figures, and there's nothing heroic at all about Prufrock and his almost pathological passivity. So whichever way you slice it, this teasing and cryptic refrain is a riposte or a retort to Prufrock and his self-image. In the rest of the poem, he tries to compare himself by turns to a prophet, John the Baptist, a miraculous biblical figure, Lazarus, and a tragic hero, Hamlet, but each time he comes up short. Whenever some kind of desire is mentioned, it invariably ends in inertia or abandonment because Prufrock cannot follow through on anything. By the poem's end, he seems to have taken stock of his life and character and accepted that he will only ever play a minor role. I say seems because this is not a narrative poem as such. It doesn't unfold in time with each section or stanza growing out of the one before. Rather, it's better to think of it as a moment of consciousness or a constellation of such moments spread across several pages of text. Let's move now to the final lines. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves combing the white hair of the waves blown back. When the wind blows the white water and the water white and black, we have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. The beach is the place where Prufrock indulges his romantic dreams. So the mermaids embody his desire for escape and withdrawal into reverie. But it's also suggested that they now cease to play that role for him. The human voices of the final line signal, signal, signify the realities of everyday life. To confront these realities then is to drown, to be truly lost and adrift. Prufrock's romantic fantasies about the sea thus show him to be at an impasse, unable to surrender to them as he once did, and live a life of empty distraction, but also incapable of overcoming those frivolous and idle impulses that have ruled his life. I mentioned earlier the references to fog, sleep, and etherization. In a real sense, then, this is a poem about paralysis and passivity, about lassitude and lethargy, and about a kind of spiritual malady. Through his self-analysis, Prufrock exposes the spiritual hollowness, the alienation and anxiety of all those who live as slaves to the flesh. And in doing so, he approaches an awareness of the futility of romance. In Eliot's hands, this also becomes a weapon to be wielded against romanticism, romantic poetry, romantic personality. All three of these things unravel in the course of the poem, as Prufrock's disillusioning character seems by degrees to lose touch with what's real. Okay, and that's where I'm going to leave the talk. Thanks to all for your attention.